At the end of last summer, I was contacted by a company that is doing coral reef restoration in various parts of the world. And what they're doing is taking these metal frames, which they call reef stars, and tying on fragments of live coral and putting it back in the oceans to reseed the coral beds. And apparently it's quite successful. But one issue they were having is they're using nylon cable ties to tie the fragments on. And there's rather a lot of these going back into the oceans. And of course they're not biodegradable. So they basically said, can I come up with an alternative that would degrade in the oceans? It would need to survive for a couple of years. But uh, it was an interesting project to look at and I have played around with biodegradable materials in the past and done a few biodegradable ties but marine environments are quite challenging so uh, I put my thinking cap on and started doing some experiments to see what I could come up with. After doing a little bit of research into potentially suitable polymers I eventually settled on polycaprolactone which uh, I have used before I think the name roughly translates as many goat's milk because it's derived from uh, caproic acid which is a fatty acid found in goat's milk there's a couple of others but uh, it's quite a nice material and uh, these are the finished ties which actually took a little while to develop but uh, they seem to be happy with them and they're currently being tested and uh, a few other people have tried these as well they seem to be proving popular with farmers so there are obviously some quite conscientious farmers out there these days but it works and looks just like a standard cable tie it takes about 15 kilograms not as strong as a nylon tie but this is a, a totally different ball game there were a couple of other materials that might have done the job there's a material called uh, nylon 4 which has been doing the rounds over the last few years i've not seen any convincing research that it is as biodegradable as they, they uh, claim it is but uh, doesn't stop manufacturers from producing products which allegedly have nylon 4 in them. I've seen toothbrushes made with nylon 4 bristles uh, but I can't get hold of any to test it. Uh, another material that's quite interesting is something called Tefaflex which apparently has similar properties to um, polyurethane which is what this is. Uh, there's only one company that makes Tefa Flex, Tefa Inc, T P H A over in the US. It's mostly used for uh, biodegradable medical products, and I imagine it's quite expensive. It's produced from uh, genetically engineered bacteria, which they actually feed party drugs to to get it to synthesize what they want. Uh, we'd love to try it at some point, but uh, on paper, it's supposed to be quite strong and stretchy, rather like polyurethane. So uh, an interesting material if I can ever get hold of it. Nobody knows how to mass produce the stuff synthetically just yet, but uh, possibly a future biodegradable polymer that will uh, make some difference if anybody can figure that problem out. Uh, so anyway, I, I went with the polycaprolactone. Not many companies make this stuff. One of the main suppliers is, well, currently they're called Ingevity, based in the UK. Before then, they were called Perstorp, and before then they were called Solvay, who produced uh, a material called Kappa 6500, which is what this is. It's relatively expensive. You can pay about 20 kilos for this, but it is quite widely available. It's often listed on eBay under various names, uh, Polymorph, Morph Plast, uh, Plastimorph, and variations on the theme. I think it used to be sold as friendly plastic in the US back during the 90s. Uh, and it's used as a modelling material because if you stick this in hot water, it melts and then you can squidge it into whatever shape you want. And uh, it sets hard after that. So uh, it's quite a versatile material. I've used this for master batching purposes as well because you can melt it and blend in powders and so on. And uh, it will blend with quite a lot of materials, including polyurethanes. So uh, it's a useful material to have around, but it is quite expensive. Uh, you will see on a lot of the listings that they claim it's uh, similar to nylon. Uh, not quite really, even the Wikipedia page on polycaprolactone says it's similar to nylon. Uh, it is on a molecular level, but in terms of physical properties, it's a totally different animal, I'm afraid. So uh, it's more like a polyethylene than uh, a, a nylon, but uh, it's, it's strong enough. So uh, anyway, that's the result. I'll show you roughly what's going on on the biodegradable side. Uh, I'll need to get the whiteboard for that. But uh, once you understand roughly how these materials work, you can see how more work is needed in this area to come up with some better ones. The uh, 
the Tefa stuff, I think, is, is possibly the best candidate for a biodegradable polymer going forwards. It's in the same family as polylactic acid, which is quite popular, and people in the 3D printing community know all about that stuff. But that is not biodegradable in the environment. That only degrades in hot composting facilities. So uh, I don't think that's uh, a solution. I could have made these in polylactic acid and they would have been a bit cheaper, but uh, they're not going to degrade in the ocean, so a pointless exercise. Uh, anyhow, I'll grab the whiteboard and I'll show you what this stuff looks like on uh, a molecular level. This is the molecular structure of polycaprolactone, and importantly it has this carbon dioxide or ester group, as chemists like to call it, and this can be attacked by water. CO2 and water do react slightly. Uh, this is the key to fizzy drinks and beer and so on and it forms carbonic acid which is a reversible reaction but because uh, polycoprolactone and other polyesters have got this linkage in them water can come in and break this bond here and that chops the molecule up and turns it into something which uh, microbes can eat basically a slight variation on the theme is if we replace that oxygen with what's left of an ammonia group so we've got a nitrogen here this becomes nylon 6. They're made in slightly different ways, but you can see there's not a huge amount of difference between polycaprolactone and polyamide 6. So in that sense, PCL is similar to nylon, but uh, it's superficial because once you get rid of this CO2 group, there's no way for the water to react with this and break it down. So nylons are fairly stable, whereas polycaprolactone and other polyesters, which have got this link in them, they're the ones that can be biodegradable. There is uh, a slight variation on a theme. I haven't drawn my links in here, look. A slight variation on the theme. These are repeated stepwise in both directions, but you can also flip these over. So we could also have the same sort of structure, but which had a carbon dioxide here, and then the remnants of our ammonia here, and then this would daisy chain on. So because these are now symmetrical, this actually becomes nylon 6-6. It's made in a, a slightly different way. Nylon 6 comes from a single monomer. Nylon 6-6 uses two monomers, an acid and uh, a base. That's the amino group here. Won't get too much into the chemistry. But superficially, yeah, polycaprolactone is similar-ish to the nylons, but it's very, very superficial in terms of the physical properties. Very slight changes and the molecular structure can have huge consequences in terms of the physical properties. So whereas polycaprolactone will melt at about 60 degrees, nylon 6.6, you're talking more like 260 degrees. And obviously there's the biodegradable connotations of them. Uh, one other thing that is common between polycaprolactone and nylons is nylon 6 was developed at DuPont by Carruthers and the team, as was polycaprolactone, slightly earlier in fact. I think polycaprolactone was uh, developed around 1934-ish. Uh, this was Carruthers, uh, who else was involved in that? Natter, uh, and uh, Julian Hill, I think, was the third chemist. So uh, quite an illustrious group, actually. They did a lot of work on polymers during the 1930s over there. But both of these come from the same stable. So in that sense, I think you could say there is some similarity with nylon, but uh, I wouldn't take that to, too far. Realistically, this stuff is a lot more like polyethylene in terms of its physical properties but uh, it's strong enough to work with so uh, it has its uses as well as the polycaprolactone uh, I did look at a few other materials this is uh, poly 3 hydroxybutanoate this is relatively commonly available uh, it was actually identified in the 1920s. A lot of these biodegradable materials actually go back to the 1920s and 30s. They've been around for a long, long time. But this wasn't uh, industrially produced until ICI showed up in the late 70s. But it's difficult to make. Uh, it's relatively weak and it's never really caught on. This is a, a batch produced by a company called Ecoman over in Shenzhen. Uh, I think this was a custom grade they did for me for a few years ago. It is quite tricky to mould. You have to keep it below 120 degrees, otherwise it basically turns into a sticky syrup, uh, which is quite nasty and uh, sticks to everything, and it stinks really badly as well. But it does have a few uh, useful properties, as well as being biodegradable in the environment. Uh, I haven't quite figured out what I'm going to do with this stuff. I've experimented with it over the years, but uh, uh, one day I'll get around to doing something interesting with it. 
uh, and this is a slightly shorter monomer as well. This is a, a six carbon monomer. This is a four. Uh, the Tefa Flex I mentioned earlier is similar to this. It's another four. And this is a three carbon monomer. This is polylactic acid, which is probably the most uh, well known of the biodegradable polyesters. This is actually uh, a fairly soft grade from a company in Germany called FKUR. It's a material called Bioflex, and according to the bag in the background here, it says it's uh, F1110. They do a couple of dozen of different uh, versions of this. It is certified as compostable, but uh, it's not biodegradable in the sense that you can just throw it in the environment and expect it to go away. I think it will probably break down over a century or two, but it's not gonna go in a, a few years like this stuff does. So uh, it's cheap, it's mass produced, it's easy to work with compared to these two polymers, uh, but it's not got the biodegradable credentials really. Uh, and there is a, another one on the end here, which I haven't got yet. There's a, a polyglycolic acid as it's called, which is a two carbon monomer, uh, and it breaks down in water quite quickly. It's mostly used for uh, biomedical applications, sutures and things like this. It's quite a high temperature polymer uh, up there with nylons, uh, but uh, I figured that stuff would be a little bit too sensitive in a marine environment, so uh, I didn't look into that. But I know somebody who might have a few kilos of it kicking around, so if they can find it, they're going to send it over to me and we'll have a play with that at some point in the future. Uh, there is a, a nice photograph on a company website, a company called Kura Ha over in Japan, and they produce a material called uh, Kura Dux, I think it is, uh, and they show a, a sphere dissolving in water over a period of few months. Uh, I'll splice in a quick picture of that actually. So this is the uh, Kuraha website demonstrating the Kuradux material. I should perhaps have uh, looked at this a little earlier because they show the uh, molecular structure and how it breaks down a uh, slightly different layout to what I showed. I prefer to put the uh, oxygen over here because then it emphasizes the carbon dioxide bit which is the important ester link. But as you can see, water comes in, attaches the hydrogen here, attaches the OH here. So what we've now got is uh, hydroxy uh, fatty acid, as these are termed. This is glycolic acid. I think it's produced naturally in the body, so it breaks down quite easily in the environment. And, uh, of course, bacteria can munch this stuff up out in the environment and uh, it degrades back to CO2 and water. Uh, this is the... Uh, Curadux sphere that I mentioned which is quite a nice illustration of how this stuff will degrade and this doesn't require uh, bacteria to do it this is run at 90 degrees so it breaks down fairly quickly this is basically the water attacking the polymer and turning it into glycolic acid uh, it takes a bit longer obviously at lower temperatures uh, and they are good enough actually to include a formula so you can extrapolate from this to see how it works so hopefully I'm going to get some of this material in the not too distant future. If it's okay, I am told it's a, uh, a few years old, but uh, somebody did say they had a few kilos of it in a sealed bag some, sitting on a shelf somewhere. So if that comes through, uh, we'll do some experiments on this uh, at a later stage. But uh, fascinating material, these uh, aliphatic polyesters, and there are hundreds and hundreds of them out there, but not all of them are being commercialised. Uh, sometimes it's because the physical properties aren't what you need sometimes they're just very difficult to synthesize in the first place and in some cases nobody really knows how to do it so uh, a lot more research to be done in this area so uh, polyglycolic acid i think has some uh, interesting properties but uh, i haven't got any of that to play with just yet uh, and probably the most popular polyester is the polyethylene terephthalate which plastic bottles are made out of uh, there have been reports of some bacteria that can break this down, but I think they're these extremophiles that only live in exotic locations. So in the environment, this isn't really going to go anywhere. It's a difficult material to mould, actually, PET. There are alternatives. There's a material called polybutylene terephthalate, which uh, is a little easier to mould. And there is a biodegradable version of that where they stick some, uh, basically the same sort of uh, uh, shorter chain polyesters in there, poly butylene adipate terephthalate to give it its full title i might be able to get hold of some of that actually at some point in the future to have a play with but uh, there are hundreds and hundreds of variations on these biodegradable polyesters more or less biodegradable depending on the conditions but uh, having done a lot of research on it i think the go-to material at the moment is this stuff and um, possibly the p3hb uh, i would love the p4hb if i could ever get hold of any but uh, for the time being, 
I think this is probably the best biodegradable plastic available because uh, it is known from extensive research to break down in most environments where it could end up, including the oceans. Um, while I'm showing uh, some websites, if you go to the uh, Rapstrap website, there's an extensive write-up I've done here about uh, polycaprolactone and how it breaks down. Again, here's the, the polymer itself. It's actually made from... Uh, a ring-shaped molecule, this is caprolactone, which comes from that caproic acid, which is found in goat's milk, uh, and this is produced by ring-opening polymerization, which breaks a bond here and stitches them all together, and you can see how it's asymmetric. They're just linked one after the next after the next. You can get the uh, symmetrical form. These are the, uh, the adipates and the succinates and various other variations on a theme. But this explains all of the... Uh, uh, ins and outs of how it works. This is the glycolic acid. Uh, polylactic acid you can see is a branched version which significantly affects how it breaks down. This is the poly-3 uh, hydroxy butyrate which uh, has an extra hydrocarbon link so it's very similar to polylactic acid just slightly longer which again changes the, uh, the properties. Uh, and this is the poly-4 version of it where it's very similar to the polycaprolactone just with a, a shorter monomer. Uh, in terms of the hydrolysis, there's more information on here about how it breaks down and some photographs and so on. Uh, and uh, some comparisons with polylactic acid, showing how it doesn't break down. You can view this, I'll put a link in the description at the bottom. Uh, and some research to show the difference. There's a, a research paper which, uh, uh, if you can find it, uh, I did find a, a preprint version which is uh, available but this was a, a collaboration done at the University of Manchester in the UK where they actually tested three millimeter plaques of polycaprolactone and polylactic acid. Normally a lot of the research that's done, which is actually done at universities to be honest, so they're generally only two to three year time frames, which isn't great for long term biodegradability studies. But with the polycaprolactone they found that even at fairly modest temperatures uh, in compost in a lab it broke down fairly quickly and it wasn't too much difference uh, in soil and even outdoors uh, just uncontrolled burying them in the soil around campus they found that polylactic acid broke down relatively quickly uh, this bit here is interesting the fact that it seems to have gone up I suspect that's more measurement error than anything uh, but I'll come back to that in a little while because uh, I think I know what's going on here. They don't actually say what time of year this is. So I think there is a seasonality to the breakdown of these materials in the environment, which would make sense. And then they did comparable tests with some polylactic acid. Uh, it's unusual to use moulded test plaques. Mostly they use films because they can be solution cast in a, a university laboratory. But polylactic acid did absolutely nothing below about 50 degrees uh, and uh, outdoors absolutely nothing happens to this stuff even over a two-year time frame so if you're looking for a polymer that breaks down in the environment polycaprolactone is certainly a lot better than polylactic acid uh, and on the final page here uh, there's quite a few uh, references which I went through when I was doing the research here uh, so if you're interested in this stuff go check some of these out and uh, it does give you uh, quite a lot of background information uh, but uh, anyhow that's uh, roughly the state of the art in these materials at the moment. I think what we'll now do is uh, go have a look at some uh, actual results uh, and see what this stuff does in reality. So how does this stuff actually behave in the environment? Well at the end of last year once I got some samples of these being made I put them into just a, a plant pot and left them for a few weeks and I was quite surprised when I came back after probably only two months, that one of them had started to disintegrate quite badly. And I'll show you this up close under the microscope in a few minutes. Uh, I haven't been able to replicate that quite as well since. I have tried it in a few other plant pots. So either I got lucky with that, or I think there is that seasonal aspect, which I mentioned a, a minute ago. Uh, I haven't seen any research to confirm that there is a seasonality to the decay rate of this material. But uh, I have some more trials ongoing, and although it's currently only midsummer, uh, we'll find out for sure in a few months' time. Uh, I've also got a little terrarium going here, which uh, has gone rather green. And uh, this is basically just some potting compost, and buried in here 
are some of my sample ties. If I can fish one out, I might need a pair of tweezers to do this. But that has, uh, oh yeah, something's happened to that. We'll go have a look at this under the microscope as well. It certainly, oh, well that head is broken off. So I think that is indeed decaying. I'll clean this up a little bit and we'll go have a look at it under the microscope and see what's happening. These have probably been in the compost for a few months. It's not been at an elevated temperature, but uh, I have kept the lid on, so it's uh, been kept very moist. And obviously with water being the main element that breaks these down, along with some enzymatic help from the bacteria. After all, bacteria synthesize these kind of molecules. You'd expect them to have the ability to break them down as well. But uh, I'll scrape off some of this crud uh, and we'll have a look at that because uh, that does look interesting. I've not actually checked these. They've probably been on the windowsill for about three, four months now. Uh, but it's looking good. So, uh, okay, let's have a closer inspection. Okay, this is the top portion of that sample I just showed you. And there's a little bit of brown staining on it and a few pits here and there. But you can see the teeth are pretty much intact. Uh, the blue streaks are just some contamination from the material I was running beforehand. But if we move down here to the fragment that's broken off, this is a whole different story, and that's pretty horrific, really. You can see how the bacteria, or probably fungi in this case, have actually got in and started digesting this. Uh, remember, this wasn't at a high temperature. This was only about 15 degrees C last autumn. And it's done a fairly good job. In fact, the end bit disappeared into the compost somewhere. So that's still in a plant pot. Uh, not completely gone, but I think that's fairly convincing that just putting this stuff in a damp environment where there's microorganisms available uh, definitely does deteriorate this stuff fairly quickly. Uh, conditions are obviously going to vary from one place to another. So exactly how long it takes for this to completely go back to nature probably two or three years minimum I would have thought but uh, it's certainly going and I have done similar tests with polylactic acid and you see absolutely nothing so um, I'm reasonably happy that this stuff does do what it's said to do so uh, now let's have a look at that other one which uh, I've just got out of my mini terrarium right this is a, a fresh one just for comparison and you can see how smooth the edges are on this tie. There's no degradation there at all because that's been in a sealed bag. I bring this one in you can see that there's some obvious deterioration going onto the surface. It hasn't gone quite as much as the one we just looked at but I think there's a big chunk out of that side there look. I think this is definitely starting to break down. It's not leaving the brown staining like we saw before if I move that up to the top and bring the control specimen in, I think you can definitely see how there's there's some significant erosion taking place there. There's a lot of cratering on that edge. So this is going, and there's some brown staining on the edge there where it's starting to go. Let me see if I can zoom in a little bit closer. I'm going to slide. Right, this is a little bit closer. This is the, the control one. And if I bring in the one that's been in compost. I'm picking up this red stuff here, I'm not entirely sure what that is, but you can see the sides here are quite significantly pitted. That's pretty nasty. I'm not sure why it's gone red. There's some bites out of it there, something's been having its lunch. And there's quite a nice fragment on the edge. Let's have a look on the other side. Oops. So this is the back, and again we're seeing pitting. It's not gone as far as that first sample I showed you, but it's definitely going. So I think if this was left for a few more months, this would probably show more significant results. And as I mentioned, I think there is a seasonality about this, and my hunch is that because it's known that fungi are one of the main degraders of this material. Mushrooms tend to come out in the autumn. So it may be that that first specimen that I put in just happened to time itself with when the fungi were active and starting to grow. 
So I'm going to leave these in the pot for another few months and we'll come back later in the year and have another inspection and just see if my idea is right that it has something to do with fungal activity in the cooler autumn. But anyhow it is definitely going so uh, we'll wait to hear what happens in the oceans that could take a I don't know maybe another year before we get any feedback from that but certainly I'm reasonably confident this material does what it's supposed to. And as a comparison this is some polylactic acid which uh, I've also had in compost for a few months now I think this is FKUR 2110 not the 1110 granules that I showed you earlier it's a very slightly stiffer compound uh, and there's a bit of moss on there but the edges look fairly crisp there's certainly no pitting uh, and no chunks taken out of it like we saw with the polycaprolactone so although this is probably the most commonly used biodegradable polymer it's only really biodegradable at high temperatures so you need to get this in a composting heap it's a little bit of cracking there uh, I don't know if that's where it's simply been stressed there's another little bit on the bottom edge there you can just see that kind of river pattern I think that's possibly just cracking from bending the flexing the material it is quite flexy but yeah it's not going anywhere near as much as the the PCL so uh, anyway I thought I'd just show that for completeness it's uh, a hands-down victory to the polycaprolactone right so now we've had a look at what polycaprolactone is and how it works how it degrades and we've seen some actual evidence of that happening in the ambient environment not requiring hot composting uh, it's time to have a look at some of the implications of actually molding the thing and the first problem you have with this stuff is it's actually a very weak material in terms of its yield points that's the the amount of force you need to apply before it starts to deform and it's actually lower than polyethylene so going back to that it's kind of like nylon though it's totally different and the problem I had with that was uh, it was ripping the latches out of these things so if you try to make a standard design cable tie and there are companies who are making uh, polylactic acid cable ties I know at least one company that does that and that's a fairly easy thing to do because there's so many different variants of polylactic acid it's a fairly stiff plastic uh, unless you plasticize it so it's relatively easy to just put that into a standard cable tie mold and get on with it but it doesn't degrade properly so you've got to engineer these things in such a way to compensate for that poor performance in terms of yield strength uh, and the other problem you have and here's some granules that I've just stuck in hot water and although that's in boiling water it's not really that hot at all and this is the other problem you have with the stuff it's got a very low coefficient of uh, thermal conductivity and that means when you start trying to mold it you've got to wait an awful long time for this to cool down and solidify so the cycle times on these uh, I think I was running these at about 45 seconds I've seen cable tie molds running in nylon running at about 15 to 16 seconds so very much quicker nylon has a, a fairly sharp uh, melting point which means when you're going in the opposite direction cooling it down it freezes off very rapidly whereas this stuff well that's still pliable even after 30 seconds or so so that's a big issue with uh, molding this stuff you really have to leave it a long while even with a, a chiller on the mold cooling it down I think I had it as low as six degrees there weren't quite icicles hanging off the thing but it was pretty cold and it was still taking a long while to set up and if you try to extract these from the mold beforehand you're likely to deform it so uh, that was a big problem uh, and the other thing related to the temperature and this is still squishy even now uh, you if you get your feet into the uh, the hopper above about 50 degrees this stuff starts mold, uh, melting and it will block it up so you've got to be very careful on your temperatures you can process this at about 180 200 degrees just like a normal polymer but uh, the hotter it goes the longer it takes to cool down but the cooler you try and run it the less flow you have so it's harder to fill the mold so there's a lot of trade-offs there but as long as you keep that feed point where you're going into uh, the barrel below 50 degrees uh, it's not all that difficult to be honest you don't need to dry this stuff and it does granulate and you can recycle it so uh, not 
an awful material to work with, not as simple as polylactic acid, but nevertheless uh, it's doable without you know, a little bit of practice and uh, you get away with it. Now it did take me quite a few attempts to figure out how to make a cable tie out of this material and as far as I'm aware uh, I'm the only person in the world who's doing this. Uh, I think there's a company possibly in China who are making a polyethylene susanate which is another one of these uh, variations on the, uh, the polyesters. Uh, not conspicuous on the market just yet but it'd be interesting to get some at some point and see what they're like. Uh, and then there's obviously the PLA ones, but I've not seen anybody else making a proper biodegradable polylactic, uh, polycaprolactone version. So I ended up doing a lot of prototypes. Obviously I started on uh, some fairly small uh, designs and then worked my up to, way up to some slightly longer ones. These actually turned out to be releasable. So these are not as strong, these are slimmer. I think these are six millimeters, whereas the slightly longer ones, these are eight millimeters. Uh, that was necessary really to gain the strength that I needed uh, but it turned out these are actually releasable you've only got to peel pull the little latch at the uh, the head back and it comes undone uh, a few other features that I had to incorporate uh, if you look at a standard cable tie you'll notice the teeth are very very close together typically about a millimeter or so if you make the teeth that small with polycaprolactone uh, it just rips them out because it's too soft so the teeth had to be made quite a bit bigger in order to get away with that uh, and that meant making uh, the latch in the head quite a bit more robust as well so this latch is on a slight angle and that's to transfer the forces down into uh, the rear wall on this and that takes most of the pressure uh, it will give eventually but uh, with some fairly chunky teeth these are just triangular uh, it could be better if it was spark eroded i could get a more of a uh, a flat edge on the back and perhaps get a little more strength out of it but I'm not sure it would be all that much greater to be honest but a fairly chunky latch and some fairly chunky teeth was necessary to overcome the problems with the uh, the weakness and especially the yielding I also had to put these tram lines on the back which you might be able to see uh, and that's partly to give uh, the tail a little bit more strength but it was also to pack it out in the head uh, to create a little bit more tension in there so that it bites in and didn't slip back. The slipping was a, another issue. And if you've ever looked at a standard nylon cable tie, this is not really a standard one, it's the largest one I have in my collection though, so it should be more visible. But uh, you've probably realised that the, the head on these is significantly more robust than the tail section. And yet it's always the head or the latch that seems to fail. And when I was making these, I discovered why the head is so large compared to the, the tail section and initially you think well it's just for strength but it's not it's really about the rigidity of this thing and what I found when I was making the prototypes of these is that once you start to put some pressure on the loop this uh, front wall here starts to bow outwards and that means it's easier to pull the latch through uh, and also the side walls will stretch very slightly and we're only talking fractions of a millimetre here but they do add up so that also makes the, uh, the latch less robust and the final thing that happens is the rear wall actually bows down slightly under the pressure and those things contribute and add up and basically make that latch considerably weaker than uh, you need it to be to retain the strength so that's really why the heads on cable ties are as chunky as they are it's not overall strength, it's to get rid of the, uh, the flexibility in, in the material and to make that latch as uh, robust as it can be. So to get around these I ended up just putting some bracing on the back of the head uh, and that stops the rear wall from bending down and then the sides and the front wall I basically just made those considerably stronger uh, so that they wouldn't flex because this is quite a soft material. So I think it took me about 20 prototypes to figure all of that out but uh, I did eventually get them working reasonably well. There is a, a central feed, if I can dig out the mould here. This is what uh, I ended up with. If I can get that without reflections in it. So this is a two cavity mould. Uh, it's a relatively straightforward thing to cut. Uh, slightly tapering on the edge. There's a couple of tram lines down the sides just to give it a bit more strength. And the feed point is actually from behind because of the configuration of the uh, where the drops are on my manifold 
Uh, I had to have a runner on the back bring it in to here and then I'm gating at the center because this material doesn't flow quite as nicely as I would have liked so I had to go with a, a centralish feed. It's slightly offset because it uh, has a little more to pack out at this end. I think with hindsight I might have moved these a fraction closer to this end but uh, I was getting consistent results with that and uh, then I had to go at a slightly smaller one. The remit for uh, the coral reef project was for something comparable to a standard cable tie 30 centimeters long but I also figured there might be a market out there for a smaller version and these are a little bit cheaper but they're never going to be as cheap as normal cable ties uh, this is molded in essentially the same way with a split runner on the back and uh, gates coming through the middle here but considering this material is you know, four times, five times as expensive as nylon, and the cycle time is three or four times longer than nylon. You are looking at quite a premium for these, but uh, they are available. Uh, if you, I think I've got some listed on eBay, or if you, you're interested in any, you can uh, check out the uh, Wrapstrap website and get in touch. Uh, but uh, as far as I know, this is uh, the only seriously proper biodegradable cable tie that I've seen. There may well be others out there, it's a big world but uh, they're not that commonly available. So uh, I've done my bit for saving the planet. This is now solidified and you can see how it's still relatively flexible. If that was nylon, that would be pretty solid material at this point. So um, anyway, that's polycaprolactone and a biodegradable cable tie. And uh, with all the offcuts of this, you can always give them to the kids and they can melt them in hot water and do some modeling with them. So a fascinating material. And uh, I'm looking forward to getting some other of these biodegradable plastics to have a play with as well. Not the easiest material to work with, but they're coming out okay. Right, and a bit of bonus bonus footage. Here's a tie that I've had around a stunt tree in the yard for a good few months now, maybe six to eight months. It's uh, survived the winter frosts and snow it's endured wind and rain and even a recent heat wave and it's still pretty tight on there in fact you can see the tree bark is actually growing over the top of it this is a known problem when you tie anything around a tree uh, they call it girdling in the trade i do have a cunning solution to that but uh, that'll be the subject of another video but anyhow this stuff is fairly durable outdoors there's no embrittlement going on here i suspect there may be some uh, degradation happening behind the scenes here where it's against the bark. Uh, I'll leave this on for another few months and then we'll take it off when we look at the terrarium samples again, see if there's any pitting and biodegradation happening behind the scenes here. But uh, generally this material is pretty stable long term. It's only when it gets in the soil that it starts to biodegrade fairly quickly. So uh, it's a, a fairly good biodegradable plastic in my opinion. It certainly does the job above ground and uh, also does what you want it to do when it gets in the ground. So uh, anyhow, that's uh, my research on polycaprolactone.